All right. Let's have a look at lexical analysis. Yeah, do you remember this from back in the day? Uh, I don't know whether I'm supposed to. <laughs> well, I'm presuming to be able to speak. Yes, yes. No, well, because well, well, you are supposed to have done a compiling techniques course just recently. So, uh, okay, then, then I remember. Then you remember. Excellent. All right. So the lexical, lexical analysis bit, it finds, uh, as I said earlier, it finds the keywords, identifiers, and constants. Uh, and makes these as tokens. So a token has uh, some information in it, which we'll come to in a bit. And the way it works out how to take the string of characters in your program and work out which tokens they have is that uh, it has a set of, recur of regular expressions, at least. Uh, often compilers have these. Sometimes compilers are written in recursive descent form, which means that you don't do this. You, you hand-build it instead, and you don't have a... Hold on, I'm not explaining this very well, am I, Pavlos? No. You're looking confused. Okay, so... I'm just, I'm just waiting for you to see where this whole thing is going. <laughs> all right, so it's perfectly possible to build your lexical analysis phase where you do it all by hand, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, it's sometimes it's not that painful unless you use nasty languages like C, C++, and things like this, right? Um, but what people have also done is said, well, look, what I can do is I can just have you write me a file describing the lexical structures within the, the program, and then I can automate the process of finding out where these things are. Okay, So I think if you've done the compiling techniques class before last year with Christoph Dubach, I think you wrote a recursive descent parser, but I, I don't know. And you haven't done it, so I don't know. Whether... All right, so but I think maybe the people listening to this will have done this. But there are tools like Lex and... Uh, Antler and a whole bunch of other compiling, uh, compiler writing tools, which allow you to write this stuff much more simply and describe uh, this is what a number looks like, this is what a, uh, a comment looks like, this is what a string looks like, and then it just builds all the rest of its stuff for you, probably more efficiently than you were able to do this by hand. Okay? Sound good? Okay. So, we write a context-free... Uh, uh, sorry, Button that we'll come to that. That's, that's a whole different thing. We write a set of regular expressions that that do this. And we've got some examples down here. Okay. Um, the first one, oh, hold on, we can draw on this. Okay. So this one here, I thought I was doing this in red. All right. This one here, uh, this one says what a letter is. Uh, a letter is just a set of uh, a set of characters, and it can be any one of these characters. Uh, a digit, this one here, says uh, that. A digit can be any of the numbers, any of the characters 0 to 9. And we say here that uh, an integer is a digit followed by 0 or more digits. This little thing here is called a clean... Ooh, that's weird. Uh, is called a clean star. Okay? You've seen these before? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, and then we've got a real number is a digit followed by some other number of digits, followed by a, uh, a dot followed by another digit, followed by some other digits. Okay, now actually, probably, uh, you have a more complicated expression for real numbers uh, in a real compiler, but this will do, okay? Uh, and a real number with uh, a, an exponent looks like that, the same bit that we had before, but it's followed by uh, something telling us what the exponent is over there, okay? Make sense? All right. So once you've described those rules, you can pass it into a Lexa generator, which will transform these regular expressions into a non-deterministic finite automaton. Do you know what that is? Um, I have no idea. Okay. So a finite automaton has a set of states. Okay. And we have a start state, and we have a number of end states. And on each of the... We'll see some examples in a second. But for each of the edges going between states, we have a character, where if I see that character, I can move from one state to the next state. Okay? Make sense? And if I get to a terminal state, I'm done. If I run out of input, and I'm not in an end state, then I have an error, and something's gone wrong. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. A non-deterministic finite automaton, for any state, the edges coming out of it can have multiple edges with the same character, okay? Which means that when you're there, if you say it's got three edges for the letter D, we don't know which state we should be going out of in order to find which character, which next state we could get to. So which one do you take? You have to take them all, right? You have to... 
<laughs> essentially, in parallel, take them all or do them one at a time until you find the, find the right thing. Okay? Which is rather painful. Now, the reason for doing this is it turns out that it's very easy to take a regular expression and convert it down to an NFA, to a non-deterministic finite automata. And the rules for doing this are really quite nice and straightforward. And graphically, you can see them. We're not going to cover them today, but graphically, you can see them. Uh, and you'll work out how to do this, and it's nice and straightforward. But they are terrible for actually doing the scanning for you, right? Because of this problem of not knowing which, which edge you should go down. But it turns out that you can take an NFA and uh, convert it down to a deterministic finite automata, where for each state, there is only one edge with a particular input required. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, there are problems with this, is that the, you can end up where you go from a non-deterministic finite automaton, which is quite small, to a deterministic finite automaton, which is very large. In fact, exponentially larger than the, determin than the NFA that you had. Okay? However, once you've got it in this DFA form, they're very fast, and it turns out that for all practical purposes that we use in compilers, you don't end up with this exponential blowout uh, unless you write your lexical rules very poorly. Uh, and so it works very nicely, and then you've got something very fast that you can go through. Okay? Even then, we don't normally just represent it as a graph like this. Um, these tools build uh, highly optimized scanner tables that allow it to go through the text very quickly, uh, scanning your code and coming up with the right answer. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, except in most compilers where it doesn't do this. <laughs> Uh, if you look at GCC, for example, this is all built by hand in, in the, the, the C front end, uh, and the, you, you won't see any of these rules written anywhere. It's all done by recursive descent and by hand-built stuff that is absolutely horrific to look at, uh, and I feel sorry for anybody who has to look at any of these things. And they do it for getting the ultimate speed out of these things that they can, they can get. Okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, whew. if we look at some examples... All right, so uh, here are some DFAs, okay? Uh, and we see that there are DFAs because for every state, there is only one edge coming out of these things for any particular input, okay? And actually, we've grouped these things because, whereas you see here, it says digit. Oop, there. Uh, this actually represents a whole bunch of edges, one for each of the digit characters that you could see, okay? So... We see here an integer, if I go back just quickly, right, we saw that an integer was represented as a digit followed by an arbitrary number of digits. And we see how this comes down to, an, to a DFA. Here we've got the same thing. We must enter with a digit there. How come I can't change that? I thought I changed this. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oop. Nope. Sorry about that. Is that in red? No. Oh, sorry, we'll keep it will keep it in black. Did I change the full color? Okay. That's, is that one that I want to do? There we go. Okay. There we go. Right, so we change, uh, so we, we start with a digit, uh, and we immediately done this, uh, symbol here with a circle inside a circle represents an end state. But we can get another digit and carry on going round, keeping getting digits there, and we're always, as long as we keep getting a digit, then we're always in the end state. If we see the character A, then here we bottom out and it doesn't know where to go, and it will produce an error for us. Okay? Mm -hmm. Happiness? Okay. All right, so that's an integer. Uh, what do you think about this one? Does this make sense to you? See if you can work out what's going on here. Mm, let me think. <laughs> it looks complicated. <laughs> Come on, basically. You get a digit, so you enter the first node. Yeah. As long as you get more digits, you stay on that node. Yeah. Unless you get a dot, in which case you move to the next node. Yeah. And after that, you have to get digits. Yep. And as long as you get these, it's you and it stay in the end of the day. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All right. And we've got a very similar thing for the uh, exponential form of the uh, real floating, the, 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 the floating point number that we got there. Okay. So, Pavlos, uh, this is, so normally I give students biscuits, but uh, you don't deserve any biscuits. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to give you the hard drugs that you probably want, so um, <laughs> you have to, you'll have to stay away from those. Uh, so, can you, uh, can you have a go with these examples for me? All right, so, so let's have a look at zero. So with zero, uh, <laughs> with zero, uh, you can only do integer. Yep. Entering and terminating mm. there. 
Yep, so it comes in there with a with zero, and we get the final state. So we're done. So the other two cases we terminate in uh, non-end modes. No yes, because so we'd end here, and that's not an end state. Yeah. We end here. Oh, I've put, oop. Okay, so those would be bad. Mm. So it must be this one. Okay. So the same basically applies to zero one. Zero one. All right. So there we get uh, zero for the first one, which comes through there, and then we go one through here. Uh, and we're done. Yeah. Yeah. 2.6 obviously doesn't work with integer because uh, we don't know how to handle dots. Yep. Uh, for the real number, we just enter with the two. Two there. Uh, then we get the dots on the next node. Yeah. So we don't we don't do this one. No. We, don't, we don't do this one here. Uh -uh. We don't do it. We move to the next node. Yeah. And then we get six, so we move to the end node. And we're on the end node. There we go. Well done. Okay. All right. All right, and what about this one? Two dots uh, won't work with uh, any. Why not? So, for example, with a real, we enter the first node with two. Yeah, two there. Then we get the dots, so we move to the next node. And then our input terminates Ooh. in a non-end mode. No. Yeah, that's not good, is it? No. Okay. All right. And what about this one? So, this one... Could only work with the last one because it has that e. Okay. So we enter the first node with two. Yeah. Move to the next one with the dot. Yeah. And then we get six. So move to the next dot, to the next node. Uh, yeah. So we're here. Yeah. Then we get the e. So again, we take the latter edge to move to the next node. Yeah. And then we get a two. So we reach the end of the node. And we're in a final, we're in a final state. Okay, great. Get rid of those. All right. And um, what about this one? Uh, it won't work because the only case that uh, handles this is the last one. Yeah. And there is no dot. Okay, so we come in with the two, and then uh, we don't have this. Then we get an E, and we don't know how to handle it at that point. Yeah. So it all falls over, and everybody goes home crying. Okay. Well done. You did very well, Pavels. A pat, a pat on the head. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that was rather... I've got to wipe my hand now. Um, <laughs> okay. Do we get extra points for answering uh, questions right during the semester? Uh, no, you get biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll give you an orange later. Uh, biscuits, well, I, I tried this last year, with, and, and the thing is, is that uh, people began to get so full with the biscuits that they asked for fruit instead, so now it's fruit. Okay. All right. So, uh, the, right. So, the job of the to, to review the job of the lexical analysis is to work out what tokens you have from the uh, from the structure. So, when we see this thing, when we see this guy up here, once we match these things, uh, for example, for the zero, it would it would match this rule here, uh, and it that rule there, and it would say you're an integer. So, it would return a token telling me that you're an integer. And what we would get in that, we would, we would probably get uh, the text value of the thing, saying the actual characters that we've got, or maybe just uh, the, the positions in the text where I can get it from. Um, we would get something saying this is a number, in this case, or an integer. Um, we might get other things if it was a different thing. We might say that it's a keyword like for, or uh, give me another keyword, while something like that, uh, that it's some kind of bracket, or it's an identifier, or it's a string, or it's a comment if we're keeping those. Most compilers don't keep them. Um, we might get uh, additional values, uh, like uh, if it's a string, we might get the text that the string has, which is not just the text in the program, if you see what I mean, because we could have had escapes, uh, you know, escape things to allow you to write tabs and things like that in the string. So we'll have replaced all of those with something sensible for us and give us the much more reasonable string that we want. Uh, the number values actually as some, you know, rather than as a textual form, it might tell me what the actual 32 bits are that the integer, are, the integer is or whatever. Um, and we also probably get some debugging information telling me what the source file is, where it was, and, you know, stuff so I can find it and tell you that you did it wrong or what other problems there are and things like this, and that I can put that information into the debugger later. Yeah? Uh, you've never needed to use a debugger, right? Because you've never had any bugs in your code. No. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so uh, normally we get rid of white space and comments because uh, who the hell needs those, right? Uh, you will find that some compilers, some source-to-source -source compilers keep it because they want to produce 
the output code that looks as close to the original code as possible. But mostly those are ditched because they're not important. Uh, and you may find that when you have errors, there are particular error tokens that get returned telling you what it is that went wrong. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what's in a token. Great. 